and we're going to move into the final session. Uh, and, and I'm going to introduce the, the moderator for, for this one. But in this panel, five members from the elect, electric sector who started the nationally recognized multi-state fleet response working group are going to share with utilities and states and local government emergency managers their distilled wisdom from hundreds of disasters that they've been involved in on how they help government uh, and how they help utilities work better together to help any organization determine their disaster response capabilities and how to make after action reporting more effective. I didn't say more fun, said more effective and productive for everyone involved. So I'm going to introduce Mike Sapone with Tempest Energy. Mike, I'm handing the, the panel over to you and you can take and run with it for the last hour of the day. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank you, Dave. And, and thank you to the All Hazards for uh, welcoming, welcoming us back again <clears throat> for Storm School. Sonny was very entertaining. We will try and be just as entertaining, but in response for her without running um, dinosaurs, you don't have to be fast. You just have to be faster than the person next to you. And uh, when it comes to eating an elephant, the best advice I can give someone is not to do it alone. And I couldn't think of a better segue uh, getting into our uh, uh, discussion today on Storm School. Uh, Storm School was conceived out of the notion that uh, and, and the knowledge um, and the experience of uh, the next generation of emergency managers not having the ability to spend enough time with the professionals that were there before them with many years of experience uh, to pass a lot of that trade uh, knowledge along. So we kind of call and refer to Storm School as the uh, online trade school for emergency managers. And when you think about the next generation, it's, it, you know, I don't want you to be confused about age. Age has nothing to do with it. Uh, there are people who are thrust into the emergency management field from other uh, careers uh, as far as taking on responsibilities or joining new organizations, whether they be public or private sector, um, or the new person uh, who comes into a company and uh, aspires to be in that emergency management field, or kind of like me, sometimes I think it chose me uh, instead of me choosing it. And uh, those veterans that find themselves, um, again, uh, with new responsibilities as organizations consolidate, companies merge, uh, they find themselves in new lines of work. And one of those lines is obviously emergency management. Storm School is for everyone. And it doesn't matter, again, uh, the sector that you currently find yourself in or whether that sector is public or private. So that being said, uh, we've got uh, four professionals with us today uh, who are going to talk at a high level on what Storm School is all about in three different categories. One of them, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, public and uh, private relationships. I've heard that. I think it was yesterday on one of the uh, uh, sections that was uh, uh, on yesterday. They were talking about relationships and the importance of it. We're going to talk about uh, how to leverage those to create success for everyone involved when it comes to disaster planning and execution. We're gonna talk a little bit about how being more uh, predictive instead of reactive uh, can greatly help your efforts and ease the burden of trying to recover from uh, a disaster. And last but not least, we're gonna uh, close it out with a high level view of and discussion on after action reviews. Uh, we've probably heard that term mentioned a thousand times and probably will continue to hear it mentioned another hundred at least over the next day. Uh, but we're going to get into the importance of it and some of the characteristics uh, around it. So that being said, if I can have our professionals come on camera and we're just going to give them a few seconds to introduce themselves uh, and then we'll jump right into the uh, uh, we'll jump into the presentations. Uh, let's start with Carlos. You're on mute. <laughs> Way to start. So uh, <laughs> good afternoon, 
everyone, and thank you, Mike, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, again, my name is Carlos Torres, and I, uh, again, worked for Con Edison in New York for 30-plus years, and uh, since then, uh, right after my retirement, I worked down in Puerto Rico with Mike, and, uh, and, and I know Tony Hurley, the next person who's going to speak, was down in the U.S. Virgin Islands right after Hurricane Maria, and we helped during those restoration efforts. Um, then, um, right now, I'm consulting and providing support and working with this uh, esteemed group of gentlemen uh, on the storm school uh, effort, uh, and hopefully we can help you know every one of you in your in your endeavors of uh, emergency management in the utility and non-utility uh, workspace. Thanks, Carlos. Anthony. Tony Hurley, 37 years with uh, First Energy and uh, worked in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and ended my career in New Jersey as Vice President of Operations. Uh, retired in 2017 and almost immediately ended up going to the U.S. Virgin Islands for Irma Maria. Worked down there for about a year and a half and then worked throughout the United States, Middle East, and uh, I'm actually currently sitting in Puerto Rico right now, San Juan. So, um, you know, I appreciate everybody's attendance today. Thanks, Tony. Jim? Yes, everyone. Jim Nowak. I'm uh, presently with Tempest Energy as one of their customer relations uh, directors. I worked myself also 37 years for American Electric Power. I retired 2014, spent eight years in the IT world, uh, focusing on utilities, how to make them uh, more efficient through technology and spent the last year with Tempest Energy. I'm happy to be on this panel with these uh, friends that I've known over the years. And uh, during the course of my career, I didn't have the luxury or the fun of going overseas or down to the Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico, but I have been heavily involved with EEI and restoration efforts across the United States and North America. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Dave? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate uh, um, the opportunity to be here today. I'm Dave Vanderblumen, uh, 42 years at Dominion Energy, retired in 2019, and I was working when Carlos and Mike were in, um, and Tony were in the islands. I visited them. Uh, we sent several several folks and learned how to how to fill a barge up with trucks and people and material. We visited them a couple of times while they were there, and. Luckily, I got to leave while they were still there, but that was a, a great experience and glad to be here today. Retired now, I'm, I'm consulting and been with all hazards for since 2007, I believe, and uh, on the fleet response work group. I work with these, these, these gentlemen for forever, it seems like, and I guess I'm going to be working with them forever more. And uh, one note is I don't ever want to have to follow Sunny again. She is <laughs> phenomenal. Such, such, a, <laughs> such, such passion. <laughs> Really, really enjoyed it. And thank you, Dave. Yeah. And again, uh, Mike Sapone, currently with Tempest Energy, want to congratulate Jim on his recent promotion to Vice President of Operations of Tempest Utility Consulting, but I'm not going to let go of him just quite yet. Uh, he's still going to be Director of Customer Relations, so we're going to transition him over. Um, but I, you know, uh, Eversource, 35 years, last three years uh, with Tempest, uh, currently the Chief Operating Officer. I am the student here, um, I have had the privilege of learning from these four gentlemen so much over the years, and, and they were obvious choices uh, when uh, Tom Moran and I got together and discussed this idea about Storm School. But I want you to keep in mind that these are ex-utility professionals. However, they have dealt with so many public and private other sectors and organizations over the years that they bring the correct type of hands-on knowledge that is necessary for either your current or your next generation of emergency managers in your organizations to leverage so that they don't have to eat the elephant by themselves. Uh, so with that being said, if I can just keep Tony and uh, Carlos will get started. All right, Tony and Carlos, I just got done saying how much I've learned from the two of you, but one thing I've definitely learned from you is uh, how to leverage and the importance of uh, leveraging relationships with uh, the private and public sector, in particular government agencies and officials. Um, and we all know, and what I learned from you is that it can quickly create success or it has the potential to derail things 
uh, pretty quickly. So, Carlos, if we can just kind of, I'm going to play off the two of you a little bit. Uh, can we talk a little bit about some of the challenges, some of the strategies you've utilized, and then maybe even with uh, Tony chiming in, and then we'll get into some of the more tactical stuff. So I'll turn it over to you, Carlos. Sure. Thanks, Mike. And 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 this is a topic that you know all all five of us have been involved with. And, and I really I prided myself in in building relationships because. As, as a person that's led organizations and worked with organizations, it's so important that uh, you maintain this relationship and, and maintain is a key word. First is, is securing the relationship, but then is maintaining the relationship. And, and there's some key challenges that, that you, know, what, you know, Tony and I are going to speak to. And, 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 and there's four of them. And the first one is time. Then there's trust. There's misaligned priorities. And then dealing with external pressures, and I'll say that when working with uh, with with my our partners, uh, and these challenges go both ways. So it's not just I'll say the utility and government agencies. It's also government agencies and utilities, or, or any other private sector within each other. And, and you and your organization, you know, it's it's important to maintain these partnerships. And it's not a one-to-one, -one. it's probably like an octopus with tentacles and it goes out multiple ways and it comes back multiple ways. Um, so some of the strategies that, that you know, we, we've used, all of us have used to address these, this, these challenges uh, for time, it's really dedication of time and on both parts. And it, it will ensure the success in establishing and nurturing that relationship. So you need to take time and, 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 I'll, and I'll say that in, in my role as the, the Vice President of Emergency Preparedness and Business Resiliency at Con Edison, I probably spent probably 50 to 60% of my time in this area of dedicating time to building those relationships because there is definitely more blue sky time than, 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 than dark sky time. And, you know, you do not want to build a relationship in a dark sky time. And that will be the, the time that you need to spend and, and the hard work that you need to put in with your partners to, to, to nurture that relationship. And then when, when you get into, you know, the trust is really establishing a communication coordination protocol, which will build that trust. And I've always used this, uh, you know, this true and tested mantra for, for me and, and for my, my, my team at, at Con Ed, is you tell them what you know, you tell them what you don't know and let them know as soon as possible when you know what you didn't know. And that really builds that trust where I'm going to tell you what I, what, I, what I understand is going on at this moment. And this is the information I really don't know at this time. But when I get this information, I will pass it along immediately. And you need to come through when, when you make those commitments. You can't just say you're going to come through and, it's a, and, and you don't come through. So, um, and, and I, again, it's true and tested, and you know, you maintain that kind of uh, operation in, in, in dealing with your partners. I really believe you'll be successful. Um, understanding each other's organizational mission and operations as well is important because this helps you align each other's priorities and leads to building and sustaining and trusting relationships. And here, one of the things that we really did a good job with at Con Edison was training our partners about our operation. We took them, invited them for a multi-day stay at our learning center, um, and then we would train them on our electric, gas, and steam system and how it operates and how we co would coordinate um, during events. Um, also, we would include them in our exercises and drills. They, and likewise, we would ask to be a part of their exercises and drills. Now, the, the closing part, which Dave is going to cover later on, is the after action, the hot washes and after actions. That's where you gain that, again, building and trusting relationship with your partners and engaging them in those sessions for either exercises or real events. And that, again, will help sustain those relationships. Then the last uh, strategy is being cognizant of each other's external pressures and trying to help each other to deal with them. Many will be the same pressures coming from different perspectives. And, you know, I would say that sometimes I, I, I'll get pressures from my senior leadership, our board of directors, 
our customers, our agencies, but the agency may also get it from their government leadership, from their constituents. And you need to work together to deal with those external pressures. And the more you do, do that together, the better both you, both when I say both partner and, and, and the host organization or the organization will work, will, will, will flourish during those crises events. Um, at this point, I want to, I want to ask Tony, he wants to uh, add to any of those points uh, to examples or from his perspective. Thanks, thanks, Carlos. You you hit on three very very important points. One of them is the the educate. You you it it leads to the second one, which is respect. You educate. You let them know what your capabilities are, your limitations. Um, you uh, you work together, and then you end up uh, learning to respect each other's organizations, especially like you're talking. You know, you get behind closed doors, and they say, "Yes, I know that you want to give an update at six o'clock, but at four o'clock." I have to update the mayor or I have to update the county commissioners and you start learning each other's processes. So educate and respect is huge. And then the third point you touched on is nurture. It cannot be an introduction, shake the hand, and then you don't see that person again till the crisis. It's got to be something. And I, I told you before, when I moved to another organization, I had a 30-day and a 90-day onboarding where I would meet individuals. And then I would also have a repeater calendar that would remind me, I really need to get in front of this fire chief. I really need to get in front of this FEMA official. Uh, and that is just so important. And then you build that relationship and then anything is possible. So thank you. Great, great. So, so Mike, so some of the tactics that we've used uh, to address these, these, those areas, again, is that it's going to, like I said, it's going to take time and perseverance, but you need to engage with your agency frequently. Um, what, I, when I, what, I, what I've done is I set up periodic meetings, either quarterly, semi-annually, or even more often, to make sure that, that and make sure that there's a structured agenda owned by both organizations and that your partner agency will also alternate who will also alternate in terms of either hosting or developing the agenda because this is really a shared ownership this will be tough in the beginning i assure you but as the trust builds it will really become easier and it will improve because hopefully you know you know in my experience the agenda items were long and lengthy in the beginning and then it got very pointed and, and structured uh, as the, that relationship really built so um, again, take perseverance. Um, again, provide that training to allow your agency partners a better understanding of your operations and how it ties to their needs. I'll give you a great example. Right after the 2003 blackout, um, you know, I, I was the, the liaison that was at the New York City Emergency Management Office, and I had to brief New York City Mayor uh, during that restoration effort. And it was very difficult because they really didn't understand how we restored the electric transmission system. So I have to explain it while it was happening. But one of those lessons learned that we got from our after action review with our partners was we developed an annual review with all agency leadership at the state, city, and local level so they understood what it was to restore the electric transmission system. And that really Luckily, we didn't have to, you know, go through those efforts uh, since then uh, during my time, but they had a better understanding the, uh, on how we would operate and how we would need their help. Uh, you know, the same thing during Sandy was, you know, again, understanding the, our needs and their needs and working together to, to do that. Um, so aside from, and aside from training, including your partner agency in your exercise, like I said before, either as, a, as an observer, a participant, or both. And hopefully, like I said, that they would reciprocate, really benefits both, you know, both parties in their development and understanding of each other's uh, needs and wants during uh, a crisis. Um, I, I held annually a hurricane tabletop exercise that I brought in federal, state, local agencies, um, private sector partners and other neighboring utilities. And we went over to a tabletop uh, scenario, how we would 
respond to a, a, a hurricane or a tropical storm. That really built that level of understanding. And it wasn't just, you know, Con Edison with our partners. It was all of us talking together. And that really helped kind of align. Um, even through one of those training uh, exercises, we, we determined uh, that our corporate coastal storm plan wasn't in alignment with New York City or Westchester County uh, in the uh, coastal storm plan. So we sat down and compared our plans together and we were able to align it. That, so our timing during that plan was in alignment and, and was in synchron in, in synchronized. So we, when we spoke, we spoke at the right time frame and our actions were understood as we understood the, the, the city's or the county's actions. Um, again, the, the periodic meetings, the trainings, and exercises will definitely assist in better understanding each other's pressures uh, and how to best deal with them. Because many a times, one solution can address both your problems as well as that, that of your partner. And, and I call that success. So at this time, I'd like to pass it back on to Tony to give his perspective on uh, any of these uh, points. Yeah, just before we get started, you know, nothing beats a strong liaison game, Carlos. And can't, can't emphasize enough something I learned from you, which was unity of effort and unity of message. And I, and I think you really touched on them um, and gave, you know, gave the listeners um, something to be able to take action with. Um, Tony, I want to just get a couple of comments from you, but then I actually have a question for you, Tony. Go ahead. Well, the question is, how'd you get started? Huh? You know, you, you, you got into this role. Maybe it was when you arrived at, uh, you know, I think it was St. John in the Virgin Islands. Um, how, how, how'd you get things started? How, how, does the, how does the new emergency manager who's dealing with relationships and communication requirements and everything you guys have talked about, how do you get started? Well, I can tell you how I got started with the whole issue was after 9-11. So uh, this is all hazards. So, you know, after 9-11, it was actually a very robust FBI office that reached out to me as a um, utility executive and said, look, we can't do this on our own. We've got to engage others. And once you start seeing that you can work together and you start working with the federal and then the state organizations, um, it, uh, it really makes it very clear that you need each other to move forward. Then you have events like, you know, the Super Bowl where you're on a planning team and you're going through those scenarios, which we all did. Um, and then, uh, you know, even the U.S. Virgin Islands, when I went down there, U.S. Virgin Islands is in a region, um, FEMA region two, which also New Jersey is in. And when I walked in the federal room the first day and 30 percent of the people in that room are the same people that were sitting in the room during Hurricane Sandy up in the New Jersey State Rock, um, you realize that we've been through this before. And then. Carlos, who was in New York during Sandy, is in Puerto Rico. So now I have a contact there and I could call there. So you start seeing, you really start seeing the dynamics of past relationships. And uh, it's not that big of an industry. You're going to run across somebody that uh, you haven't seen in a while, but obviously the relationships are important. Um, and then Carlos, you, again, you talked about the fact that just engaging everybody. You don't know who you're going to need. And I can remember one storm, my best friend became a DOT director in Ohio. And that's what I needed. I nearly didn't need the emergency services. I needed Department of Transportation. And luckily, I had met that individual. I served on a committee with them. And he was the, you know, the rock star that helped us get through a lot. So you don't know who it is you're going to need one day. But when you do need them, you're glad you know them. Appreciate that, fellas. Um, we're going to, I do have a couple of other questions for you guys. Hopefully we're going to have some time at the end to bring us back in, uh, and address them. Uh, I'd like to bring up Jim at this point, Jim, um, we've all been there, uh, as emergency managers, we've gotten that knock on the door. Uh, one of our top executives leans their head in and says, uh, you know, I need that report and I need it in two hours or, uh, come in and says, uh, you know, are we ready? Are we prepared? Uh, that business executive, that leader of the organization probably has some meeting they're going to go to, could be a board meeting, uh, could be something that involves the media, 
with maybe the governor of a state. It, it could be a number of reasons why you're being asked, are we prepared? And it's always made me a little uneasy when it comes to it. But there's always a few people around that you could go to and say, are we ready? And these were 40 plus year veterans uh, that had been there, seen many events, uh, survived those events, have learned everything hands on. And sometimes they would say, based on the forecast, eh, it looks like it's gonna be a four day event. Uh, you're gonna have to get me X amount of resources in these craft worker positions or with this equipment, and we should be fine in four days. Those days are gone. Uh, uh, I had the advantage of learning from individuals like that, uh, but um, you know, being wrong um, and being reactive these days is is, is not favorably looked upon. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how the new era emergency manager uh, arrives at, let's say, you know, when this will be over? When can we expect our lives to be returned to normal um, with confidence in their uh, answer. Sure, that's easy. You get someone who's been around 40 years. And, <laughs> no, uh, and I, uh, probably one or two of us on the panel, myself included, uh, were or one of those employees that now transitioned and realized there's a better way. And really, when there, there is a better way. And so what I'm going to talk about is really focusing on the pre-event. Before anything hits, trying to make sure you're prepared. And I broke it into four areas. One is being prepared. Second is impact. What do we know? What do we have is number three, additional needs and fill the gap. Of course, being, and I'm gonna focus more on three and four, which is what do we have in additional needs. So uh, of course, being prepared ahead of time is one of the biggest factors. You know, you have a plan, you exercise the plan. And you don't just exercise it for the catastrophic event. You make sure you're, plan is scalable and you can execute for small, medium, or large. Make sure everybody understands their plan, knows their part. And a great thing to do is develop a checklist for everybody so they know what they have to handle. It's kind of trying, it's the chaos within the chaos, but it's really controlling that chaos that's in the chaos. Number two is the weather prediction. And I put with that facility damage impact. So what type of event are you having? Well, you know, there are all different types. You have an icing event. And an icing event is going to bring certain things that are going to be more difficult to handle. Driving, the climbing of poles, uh, the trees falling, raising back down, hitting the conductor, et cetera. Hurricanes, you have debris. You have total devastation. Back before GPS, as a hurricane came in, you went to an intersection. You had to look at a map and try to guess what street you're on. Weather prediction. You know, trust the source, you have to have a trusted source. You can do it free through the internet and there are some very good programs that are free. You can have a paid service or you can have an internal meteorologist on your team. At AEP, we were fortunate enough, we had a, a free meteorologist, but we also paid for some external advice as well as looking free. And then the damage to the infrastructure. Know what your history is of the facilities gonna be impacted. Know what type of weather, hit them before and what was the parameters and damage that it that occurred. Make sure you note the changes to the system. Have you done any hardening? Have you hardened the primary zone? Have you done improved your vegetation clearing so that maybe the uh, tree damage that you had five years ago, you're not gonna experience. Also by the type, is this gonna be pole, mostly poles damage? Is it gonna be transformers, wires, primary, secondary, et cetera? Hopefully you get a prediction model that can break it down and try to give you an estimate based on some of your history, based on how you operate, what is going to be damaged, how many pole orders, transform orders, et cetera. Number three is what do we have? And this is important, making sure you know resources. First of all, look at your company. Make sure you're not just looking at the field people. You have to look at office people, the people behind the scenes. You know, there are gonna be people who are gonna be uh, taking maps, issuing maps, hopefully they can do it digitally in today's environment. You have to also know about your leadership. Are you going to have an INS commander who walks out after 16 hours or 24 hours because they're dead, beat, fatigued? No, you do a rotation. Make sure you have your leadership. Make sure they know what they're doing, you know, what, uh, what type you're going to have. Are you going to be working on service? 
make sure you know everyone who is sick or maybe on vacation. Vacation, they'll usually come in if they're not doing anything, but if they're on a cruise, you can't get them to come back. So make sure you understand if they're on vacation, what they're doing. And as I said earlier, make sure everybody knows their, drop, their job. Then you have the contractor resources. The contractors I look at when I say resource are your native or your daily resources. Where are they? Are they working on your property or are they on their weekend? If they work four tens, they have a three day weekend. Have they taken off? They actually live uh, 200 miles away. Uh, it will take them five hours to activate or mobilize. Know where they're working. Know how they're, long it'll take them to get on your property if they're not working presently. And how many are there? You know, you may be releasing some, or you may have some that are on a special bid project. You can pull them in as long as you can afford to postpone that bid project. Know your equipment. Know what each crew has. Know what's extra you have in the, the storerooms, backyard machines, how many diggers, buckets. Make sure if you're having a snow event or, or ice event, you know how many four by fours you have. Material handlers, the length of your buckets. Your material, very important to know the material you have. Your poles, your transformers. Make sure that if you have an active storm season every year, you stock up prior to that storm season and try to estimate what material you'll use. And then if you don't use it, you can, put, you can run it through through the end of the year. Uh, you always got to answer the bean counters, making sure your counting is proper. And don't forget your, full, your fuel. Make sure you have a way to get your tanks topped off before and during. Other things are staging sites, food and lodging. Make sure you have those all lined up. So now to number four, what do we need? Now that you know what you have, the resource and material, let's see what we need. And what I mean by your total needs, when you talk about crews, let's talk about the type of crews. When I talked about the prediction, I said, do you know what type of, how many poles, how many transformers? You need to know also how many are backyard, how many are along the street? Is there any URD that's being damaged? People say well, URD being damaged during hurricanes along the shoreline, you can get that whole shoreline and you can just be shifted and you may have transformers that are just uprooted like a tree. Know how many trees you have, how many, what type of you got? You got the manual crews, you got the bucket crews, how many chippers, know your material. Then using what we discussed in section two, you discussed, we discussed the resources, the equipment and the material. So what we do is we've got a formula and it's not anything that rocket science formula and it's something that's being kind of adopted across the industry. But really you take the total number of predicted cases and, and by type. So if you know you're gonna have five pole, bro broken poles or 50 broken poles or hundred broken poles and you divide that by the number of crews times the number of jobs they could complete in a day for that type of project. It's, it's pretty easy. And it really just gives you a solid idea. But once you have that prediction, if you know you've got X number of people on and they can complete so many projects, you wanna know also then what are the expectations? Number one is always note that during an event, the event uh, isn't going to come across as it was predicted. So you have to adjust. But really knowing the number of crews and what they can do making sure you're matching up the right person with the right work. Uh, similar to what happened in 9-11, I know a, a doctor was brought in to the 9-11 situation and they said, oh, you're a doctor, yes. And they put him into surgery, uh, a unit. Well, he was a family doctor and he has not really performed surgery. Just putting people out of the wrong place, making sure that they can do what they can do and they can do it safely. The main thing you wanna do is you wanna do it safely and then you wanna do it efficiently, efficiently. And making sure that you know where your proper equipment, again, the bucket lines. Now, if you know the number of jobs, like I said, determine uh, what, how you wanna prioritize them. And by prioritizing them, you don't wanna necessarily work on services if you can work on the primary uh, laterals first. Just like anything in life, you have to do things in an orderly fashion. Now, if you can, you possibly, if you have enough resources, you can hit two avenues at the same time, but make sure you prioritize all your activities. Then uh, what you need to have occur first. Once you get all that in order, you can predict or create your ETRs, estimated time of re restoration. You know how many crews you have, you know how many jobs they can complete in a day, 
you know how many jobs you're predicting to have, they can get their portion of the work done in five days, four days. You put those all in the priority that you have them. You try to squeeze them timeline together and you figure out from beginning to end how many days it's going to take you. That's your predicted or your ETR. Global as ETR that we set at AEP. Knowing that ETR helps you move forward and determine if you have any gaps in what you need. So if you find out that you have a 10-day ETR and through some type of uh, regulation or commitment or because of customer satisfaction, you want to cut that down to seven or five or even less, then you know you need to reach out for additional resources. And doing that, you could do it through what's called mutual assistance. You have your investor-owned utilities. They have RMAGs set up, regional mutual assistance groups, municipalities. There are states that roll up by the FEMA regions and then nationally to the APPA. They are not working with FEMA, FEMA but they're aligned with FEMA so that it helps. Individually at each state level, they'll work with the FEMA representatives. And then your NRECA, the co-ops, usually grouped by state. Sometimes you get multiple states grouped together. That's your mutual assistance. Then you look at your contractors. Contractors are really separate if you go after them outside of that mutual assistance group. Note that uh, when you do get those resources, they may take a day or two to get on your property. And in doing that, you ex uh, your ETR should start on their repair work when they're able to work. They go through their onboarding. So they don't think just because you got them, they're going to be working the next hour. And you can say, oh, we got 20 crews. We've cut a half an hour off the ETR. But it may be less because it took them a day to get on property. With that, I know I ran through that pretty fast. We have a lot of information here, so I will bring Mike back up and uh, we'll move on to any questions and then next presenter. Okay, Mike. Thanks very much, Jim. And, and again, it's, it's understanding regardless of the sector you're in, the industry you're in, it's understanding your capabilities. On any given day, your organization can deal effectively with X. Uh, what would we do? How do we scale up properly and efficiently and safely to deal with something of a different variable, which is Mother Nature delivers something a little bit more than what we're capable of doing ourselves? Um, it's no different than neighbor helping neighbor, uh, people pitching in, but understanding understanding the capabilities of those around you as well and what you have access to. I guess you could call it situational awareness but great discussion for the electric utility industry, understanding that others on this call, whether it's private or public, face the same type of circumstances on a daily basis or when an adverse forecast comes across their desk or an adverse situation, whether it's predicted or whether it uh, comes all of a sudden with uh, no notice. So uh, much and appreciated. Mike, Mike, I'll, I'll add to that real quick that yeah. the fact that um, you know, what I've gone through, I've also worked with other sectors, you know, telecommunications, transportation, you, it's all the same. It's a process, having that process established. So even though I got many years with the utilities and electrical sector, this process really it works for everyone. Much appreciated, Jim. Uh, next, uh, well, we, we've talked, we've, we've allowed Carlos and Tony and Jim to bring us up to the event. They've talked about uh, preparatory things, um, scaling up, uh, being uh, 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 proactive instead of reactive uh, when it comes to relationship building, planning, exercising, liaison game strong, right? Uh, and then Jim with how do you scale up uh, based on a forecast or again, when something happens uh, that adversely affects your ability and forces you outside of your daily capabilities. Uh, let's talk about after the event. Uh, when all the smoke is cleared, let's say, and things are starting to return back to normal, it's time to reflect. Uh, and that reflection is important because it becomes the next and first phase in the following cycle, which is before the next event, there's some things we probably should improve upon. And there's probably some things that uh, we're really good at that uh, we should keep on doing. Uh, so with that, we're going to bring up uh, Dave Vanderblom, Bloman, and Dave is going to uh, speak to us about the importance of and the characteristics of the After Action Review. Go ahead, Dave. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and I appreciate it. We've heard the, the words. I've heard postmortem, 
hot wash after action review. Um, and I want to just start out with my definition of an accident after action review is really just a tool used to evaluate your performance on a project or event. The object of the uh, objective of, of, of this is to really benchmark your expectations, identify strengths, identify areas of concern, as well as a process to communicate, prioritize, assign, track, and implement your identified improvements. To me, an AAR is really, an after action review is a lot like a hot wash. They both ask the same questions. However, to me, a hot wash is usually conducted immediately after the event. It includes everybody that was involved in that, in that event, and it's focused at a much higher level. Items identified in a hot wash will usually require a follow-up, a very thorough follow-up after action review to that process to ensure that any recommendations presented are well vetted, well evaluated with the appropriate subject matter experts. You really don't want a knee jerk reaction uh, to, your, to, your, um, to your plans. So why do you do them? Um, I've talked a little bit about it. Most top performing organizations rely on continual improvement to ensure the highest degree of safety, meet stakeholder investor expectations, prioritize your investments, and remain, remain competitive in your discipline. That said, in order to meet those objectives, having an efficient and effective after action review process can be instrumental in achieving those results. And if you don't believe in me, believe in that, you can always go back to Albert Einstein's definition of insanity, and that's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So that being said, um, again, I was involved in utility industry uh, uh, 42 years, and I've been around a ton of action, a ton of after action reviews. Um, so what does a good one look like and what does a bad one look like? Well, let's start out with a bad one. And I've been to both. Um, if, uh, if you've been uh, attending after action reviews and it's really felt more like a check the box activity, or you were told to attend an after action review and you weren't given any expectations of what your role in that is, uh, or you haven't done any research on the, on, on the topic, you just showed up because they told you to be there, uh, or you don't expect any measurable results or change because of your participation, you certainly aren't leveraging the, the value of performing a effective after action review. So now you know what a bad one looks like, how do you have a good one, right? So it's really four parts. Define the scope and objectives, and I'll talk a little bit more in depth about all four of these. Define the scope and objective, preparing for the AAR, conducting the AAR, and then drawing conclusions and, uh, and disseminating your information. So let's talk a little bit about defining the scope and the objectives of the review. Here's where you identify the process of the activities um, that you'll be reviewing. From a storm perspective, it could be your section chiefs reviewing the high level expectations of your overall plan, or it may be many individual smaller AARs focused on technical activities, resource acquisition, damage assessment, logistics, meals, hotels, staging area, materials, communications. You get the idea. All of those may roll up to that more more high level um, executive review. But you need to set those expectations. And once you set the expectations, then you need to select the subject matter experts you want to participate. Note, while these are usually done with internal stakeholders, some after action reviews may require the input from outside resources. Um, for example, uh, contract management. If you're gonna be doing a res uh, an after action review on resource acquisition, you might wanna include your contract management external partners to, to, to let you know what, what they needed and how you did with them. Communications is another way. Um, you heard Carlos and, and uh, Tony talk about it. If you're going to be having an, an after action review on your communication strategy and you're not including some of your external partners, you may not be leveraging your, 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 all of your, your, um, your resources properly. All right, now that you set the expectations and the objectives, how do you prepare for it? Well, one, schedule the AAR. And then two, notify the stakeholders that they're gonna participate. Once you've done that, communicate the objectives. What are they gonna be expected to do when they get there? And then number three is allow them the time to do a little bit of research and gather the relevant facts for, the, for, the, uh, for your exercise. Note, um, it's always good to, um, to do that as soon or as, 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 you know, as, as soon as possible after the event, but you'll be better served if you allow those folks a little bit of time to gather facts rather than them going on conjectures and opinions. I felt this was like this because of that. Because you didn't give them enough time to say, hey, this was like this because of this. And here's the facts. Those facts will serve you well. All right, now that you've prepared for the AAR, now you're gonna conduct the AAR, all right? First and foremost, communicate the ground rules. 
Respect each other and leave your stripes at the door. I'm not a vice president, I'm not a director, I'm not a manager, I'm not an individual contributor. If you invited me here, I'm a stakeholder and I got valuable information, I wanna hear from you. Evaluate process, not people. Uh, it's hard to separate the two sometimes, but process discussions need to be held in public and people discussions need to be held one-on-one -on -one in private. And encourage participation. Um, no comment should be judged. And sometimes the most vocal person in the room may drown out the person in the corner that might have the answer you're looking for or the suggestion that you're looking for. So make sure you get everybody engaged. And two, uh, the, and finally, is make sure you have lots of whiteboards, sticky, sticky notes, and a good note taker because you want to want to evaluate all the data because you're going to get a ton of information if you do this right. And when you're conducting it, there's four questions you want to answer. This is simple. What do we expect to happen? You know, what was our plan? What actually happened? Okay, what, what was the result? And then the two, two, two final things is what went well and why, because you want to recognize the people that did a good job and the processes at work. And some things just you don't want to change because it might screw 15 other things up. And then what can we improve upon and how, right? So get all that information. You gather all your sticky boats, you get all your whiteboard information, put it together. And now what do you do? The last thing is you draw your conclusions and disseminate your information. My recommendation is to you is to pick the top two or three activities that are going to yield the, the most measurable results. Don't try to boil the ocean. You can't focus on 100 things and expect to be successful. Uh, you probably, like everybody else, have financial and resource constraints. So you're not going to be able to boil the ocean as much as you want to. So how do you do that? It's really helpful to have prioritization techniques. One that worked really, really well for me was a cost and effect matrix. Google it if you don't know what it is. It really is a, a, an excellent way to help you prioritize your findings. It, it allows all your recommendations to be evaluated through the same lens, the same criteria, and gives them a score at the end so you know, you know how, how important they really are. So once you've got them prioritized, once you identify all the things that you want to do and what are the most important, pick the top two or three, and then assign those activities to an individual that will be held accountable for that activity. So hopefully you did a really good job in picking the stakeholders to be at your after action review so that you'll know who the people are that are passionate about what you're trying to, to change or what you're trying to approve upon so that they can report upon it, um, uh, report out to you. And then make sure that your progress is reported and tracked upon in intervals, right? Tell them I wanna have milestone updates in 30, 60, 90 days, whatever that is. And make sure you have a, a mechanism uh, to, to get that information to you and then document and communicate your results. It's important because if you're gonna be changing plans, if you're gonna be changing processes, you need to document it, you need to articulate it, and you need to give it out to the people that you expect to execute it. Because if not, you're gonna have the best plan in the world, but you're the only one in the world that's gonna know about it, right? So documenting it, communicating it, getting it out is really, really important. So I went over a lot of information. I went over it really, really quick. Um, because I want to make sure that, that there's some time at the end here for questions and answers. But I will leave it with this. My analogy to, to providing a good, uh, doing a good um, after action review, I would say it is, it's um, running your car, right? Having your car. You're the driver of that car. And you expect that car to run perfectly every time you get in it, right? But if you don't do maintenance and you don't take it to a mechanic or somebody to do that review on it, it's probably not going to run the same way two years, three years, four years down the road, right? Um, so if you do, a, if you take it to a qualified mechanic, they can look at all these things. They can give you, and you, I, I know if you go to one, a, a really good, good, good an, um, uh, 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 analysis, you're going to get a hundred different things. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. That's when they give it to you. Now you can prioritize, right? I need to change the oil. I may not need new shocks. I may need new tires. But if I buy new tires, I didn't buy the shocks, right? That's what's wearing out my tires. So it allows you to prioritize that thing. So every time you get in that car and drive it, it's running to the expectation based on the information that the choices that you made, right? If you don't take it to the mechanic, you're going to run it into the ground, right? And how much is it going to cost you to replace that car when you could have spent just a little bit if you did those diagnoses and done the maintenance along the way? So with that, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I love the analogy. 
Um, I'd like to call the, the panelists back up. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. I'm just going to kind of fire them at you. Hopefully we have time to get through them all. Let's just try and keep our answers as uh, concise as, as possible. One of them is, uh, Dave, for you on the after action review, someone has asked, who, who should run it? Who, who should be running an AAR? Is, is there a right answer to this? So um, I'll, I'll tell you my answer to it. Um, if you run on the, you know, I don't know what the right answer is, okay, but I'll tell you the Dave Vanderblom answer to it would be, if you're in the incident command structure, I would have the section chief over whatever process that you're, you're, you're doing the after action review, lead that after action review, facilitate it. He doesn't need to be the one that brings all the answers out, but he should be the one or she should be the one that's providing the, the scope, picking the people that, that they want or delegating it to make sure that you have the right folks. Sounds good. Anyone else? Yeah, I would say that a lot of times you don't want individuals that are too close to it. So have somebody independently, either a third party or have an organization like internal auditing who is very good at bringing out information. That'd be my advice. Carlos, yeah, you had something? Add, yeah, so I, I would I agree with both 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 gentlemen. Uh, typically, if you do have an emergency management organization, Starting, I mean, you, you sometimes need a type A personality to kind of drive people to, to engage, and they spoke to that. You got to try to get the words out of them. So somebody that that can can help you lead that conversation that's well respected within the organization will definitely help uh, the after action review process. Very good. Appreciate everyone's input. I do have another one. I actually have a couple of more. One of them, uh, and we'll we'll start with uh, we'll start with Carlos on this one. Um, we all know that there's a lot of turnover these days, both in uh, private sector uh, companies and organizations, as well as the public sector. Uh, we do know that we face changes with, with every election or every time new officials are appointed um, in, in both municipal, state, and federal government. How does, how does one stay current? Is there, a, is there some advice you could share with the group on staying current with with the who's who uh, in your contacts? Well, I'll say that if you maintain those relationships at all levels, there's always a transition when people come on board and you're gonna know who that is. It be it in on the, the regulatory framework and the government agencies. It's a little harder on the private sector because that's not, you know, maybe not as well communicated, but if you have those relationships um, you know, and you meet frequently enough with your stakeholders, you're going to know who's going to be coming on board. Uh, and then, like Tony spoke to earlier, is engaging with them, you know, getting to know them uh, and, and, and start building that relationship and have a transition document about, you know, who you are, who you, what your organization is, and, and how you're there to, to, to work with them in, in, their, in their new role. Thanks, Carlos. Jim, anything on that one? Yeah, I, I would I would just add to that, and it was great uh, information, is that I would, I try to put a mark on my calendar, reserve the time to make sure, because something always comes along that stops you from doing something, and reserve that time to make that effort. Once you've made that effort becomes a pleasure, then you know you're succeeding. When you're looking forward to meeting them, and when you do that, You'll learn, they will open up to you, whether uh, private or public, you know, oh, I'll be retiring in a year or this new administration. I'm not, not sure I'm going to be around. And you've got to build that relationship, which helps prepare you because they'll confide in you. Build, build that relationship. Outstanding. Thanks. Anyone else before we move on to the next question? Okay, uh, I do have uh, another one. Uh, Jim, you had talked about, and we, we can go all take a little bit of a stab at this. Jim, you talked a little bit about a formula and something that you could apply. I can tell you that as uh, planning section chief under Carlos in Puerto Rico, this, this worked. Uh, it's not perfect because you need to adjust as your situational awareness and your uh, damage assessment information becomes more and more accurate over time. So you have to keep adjusting it. But when faced with uh, a, how long do we think this is going to take and being able to look someone in the eye and saying, 
at this point in time, based on the current information we have, the facts, as we know them, uh, here's something that we can do. Can you just run through that uh, one more time and sure. uh, we'll we'll go from there. Yeah. So uh, real quick, you know, if you really three components of it. You, know, you get the total number of predicted cases by the type. That's to your prediction model or, you know, hate to say it, but that guy has 40 years experience if you don't have a prediction model. But today you try to get it through some means that gives you a good, fairly accurate answer. And you divide it by a combination of the cruise time to how many jobs they do a day times the number of crews. You get that number, you divide it into your total predicted cases to that type, and you get your answer. And it'll give you your total days that it needs that you need to have to get that particular work done. And you just add those all together. You do it for poles, transformers, based on your equipment, your crews, et cetera. So Three it's basically poles. knowing, it's basically knowing what you have uh, as far as resources go. It's knowing what you're up against, what's on your plate to either fix, repair, or respond to. And then knowing approximately how long each of those cases that needs to be addressed on average is going to take. And I can tell you that when you get when you get this equation up in front of you, when you begin to uh, play with the variables, if you will, you can interchange them and solve for X, Y or Z. And you can determine if I want to take some time off the duration of this, I can't change the damage I have, but I can change the number of resources I can apply to the equation effectively. And you can also work it in reverse uh, to say based on what we have we cannot get any more. Um, this is approximately how long it will take us based on the facts as we know it with damage. So I know we are at four, I have 428. I know we're at a hard stop uh, at 530. I, I wanna thank the panelists. There was one last question, uh, or more of a comment, but I'd like to address it. It's, you know, there's a wealth of experience here on this panel. I hate to say it, but it's well over a hundred years. Uh, and I'm the junior member here. Um, so, um, you know, my hat's off to you. Everything I've learned from you gentlemen over the years, uh, very appreciative of it. But how do you pass along this information given today's business climate? And, and there may be, I'll, I'll let everybody comment, but what I do want to say is that's why we came up with Storm School. We came up with Storm School and the concept because there never seemed to be enough time to pass this information along to the person who was receiving the torch or the duty or the responsibility with enough time to be able to be effective on their first event. And we never knew when that event was going to take place. So, oh, Tom, Tom is running the, running the board here. I appreciate it, Tom. This is what it's all about. There are courses, uh, there are experienced instructors to give you that trade school um, uh, lessons uh, when it comes to the things that are uh, you think are you're falling short on, or if you're aspiring to be in the emergency management field, why not learn from emergency managers who are still in the industry or who have left the industry, but still providing information to organizations to help them improve on their preparedness, their execution, their mitigation, which turns into their next um uh, their next phase or preparedness for the next event. So www.stormschool.org, uh, go there, take a look. It really doesn't matter what phase of your uh, emergency management career or, or what, what, what phase you're in. And it really doesn't matter what industry you're in or what sector you're in. There's something for everyone here. Um, with that... Mike, yes, sir. We're, we're, we're up on 530. I know you asked for comments. We'll have to skip it. Uh, okay. Until next time. <laughs> no, I don't have a, I don't have a problem uh, no. with it. I appreciate everyone's time and okay. obviously a nice round of applause for the professionals we had here today, uh, teaching us all a little something. Yeah, so uh, right. thank you, Tom. Do you have next steps yeah. for us? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, thanks again to our panelists there. I want to also thank our supporters and our sponsors. We're going to move uh, to we're in track two, we're going to move to track one, uh, and that means we're going to close this track. And everybody could just go to ahc2023.com 
and click on track one and we'll have the follow on session there at the reception and so forth there. So uh, thank you all for attending today. We'll see you tomorrow. The links will be posted on AHC2023.com tonight, if not tonight, first thing like early, early in the morning. Um, so I'll close this track down. We'll move over to track one and uh, we'll see all of you at the reception that uh, can make it. Thank you very much for attending today.